Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullaha wa qulu qawlan sadeeda. Yusulih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfil lakum zunubakum. Wa man yuti'illaha wa rasoolahu faqad faza fawzan azeema. Sadaqallahul Azim. My dear respected brothers and sisters, firstly, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think we can get a better salam than that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's very good. Now let's get a quick hands up of how many people are married. You've got to put your hands really high, really high. Right. I can see some guy pushing the other guy's hand. It's not. It's not right to do that, yeah? And is he in doubt or something? Okay, those of you who are not married, hands up really high. Wow, we've got a lot of people that are not married here. Right. Those of you who want to get married right now, just say, Kabul and Nikah, done. <laughs> La ilaha illallah. Okay, now, we're here for a session about getting married and staying married. And I can see you've got a big divide within the room of people who are married and who are not married. Now, marriage is a wonderful thing, okay? It's one of the best things that's going to happen in your life, inshallah. Say inshallah. I hear a very quiet inshallah in the room. Come on, guys, have some hopes. It's the best thing in your life that's going to happen. Look, you get born, it's the best thing for the world, right? You got born, yeah? And then the next biggest moment in your life is actually when you get married. It's one of the biggest moments in your life. You choose your partner, you get married, you have your own family and so on. And everything, inshallah. From that point onwards, changes. Okay, you're gonna have a new life, inshallah. Now, you look forward to a lot of things. What, what is marriage about? Marriage is about you protecting your chastity, you protect your, you know, your, 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 your own honor, your dignity, you keep, it helps you to keep your eyes down. It gives you a family because you need a family for the latter part of your life. Okay, you need a family. Now, a lot of people are like, you know, what I'm gonna do? I'm not gonna get married. No, I'm gonna stay on my own. I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna enjoy life. You can enjoy life right now, that's fine. You're 20 years old, you're 24 years old, you got your own job, you get 30 and you enjoy your life, fine. You got your own flat, you got your own, own, you know, own money and income. But what happens when you get to 45? When you get to 50? When you get to 55, 60? You're going to find out, you're going to start seeing everyone's got their own families, that have got their own wives, husbands, children and so on. Where's my, where's my family? Because your family, most of them before you, look right now, look, you're young. Let me, let, me, let me break it up to you because some of you might not understand. Because the new world is all about independent, like have, be independent from everyone. I can do everything on my own. I can do everything on my own. Right now you got a mom, you got a dad, you got siblings, everyone's young and so on. Everything's going good. In 25 years time, 30 years time, they're all gonna grow, all right? When you become 45, your mom and dad are probably not around. You better start thinking about that. That is something serious for you to think about. When you, when you get old, you're going to find out that's something very, very different. You look at life very different. You need a family around you. So anyway, marriage is about a lot of great things, moments of happiness you're going to share with one another. You need the other half. You need a partner. Why? Because Allah created us as opposites. Any opposites He created, they need each other. All right? The night needs the day. The day needs the night. These are opposites. Allah created that. We're, we, we stay in harmony with one another because we, we want one another. Allah created the man and, and the woman in that way. That the man is not happy until he has his woman. Adam salam, he wasn't happy until Hawa was created in Jannah. He had the whole of Jannah. Imagine this, the whole of Jannah to himself. And he was a, became, it became, you know, it was lovely to be in Jannah, but he had something missing. He wanted to share it with somebody, but he didn't even know because he never even saw another human being. He didn't know. And one day Allah Azza wa Jal, he created Hawa. He just fell asleep and then when he opens his eyes, he sees this beautiful person. Oh my God, she's so beautiful. And she has what he doesn't have. And she has what he doesn't have. 
It was beautiful. It, this, was, this is the epitome of, of your life. This is the best part of your life. You, you get to, to be with the person that are of the, and you have those things which the other person doesn't have. But it comes with a price. You understand, guys? You don't understand. When you have something which the other person doesn't have, you are different from the other person, yes or no? Come on, guys, come on, do the maths, man. Are you, what's the matter? I'm going to do the maths for you. You talk to me when I'm talking to you. Yes or no, guys, come on. It comes with a price because you've got to know how a woman is. You've got to know how a man is. Man has distinct qualities. Woman has distinct qualities. And they've got to know each other. They've got to navigate with one another's qualities. And if you're good at that, and if you know what's happening, then you'll have a good time. Otherwise, if you start, if you want to be, if you want, I'm just telling you straight up to, to the men right now. Some men are like, no, I want the woman to be like this. I want the woman to think like me. I want the woman to be like me. I want the woman to, to, to act like me. Well, if the woman was like you and talking like you and acting like you, then she'd be a man. <laughs> and they're saying to a woman, what are you women doing? You want the man to think like you, to feel like you, to be like you, to be like all your friends and so on. No way. He's going to be a woman. And that's not what you wanted. You want them to have the opposite qualities and that's why you were attracted to one another in the first place. Okay? Now, you're going to have, inshallah, a wonderful life. Now, this whole session is going to be about finding your spouse, finding the right person, and staying with them for the rest of your life, inshallah. Say, inshallah. Come on, guys. Inshallah. Good. Some of you are like, you know, marriage, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go into it and I'm going to test it out. Indeed. I'll see if I like you, yeah. If I like you, I'll keep you. If I don't like you, I'll just replace you, innit? Like an Amazon.com, I just order something that comes home, yeah? I got 30 days to earn policy, innit? I just return it back when I don't like it. What's wrong with you, lot? Seriously, you're going to look at marriage like Amazon.com? You're going to look at marriage like you know, it's going to be replaced? You know, there, there was actually, there was a real interview of an of a eight-year-old man and eight-year-old woman. They were married for 60 years, and they had an interview on the 80th, you know, on the 80th year and the 60th year of anniversary. They had an interview, and they were asked, "What made you guys stay together so long?" And you know what? What they said? The man said, "He said we were born at a time when our toys broke. We mended them. We didn't replace them." Do you guys get that? Uh, like one, some of you getting it. No, some of you are not getting it. Come on, you guys got that yes or no? Right? Our day and age, what is it? You, you find something that is broken, you straight away, you replace it. It's the TikTok generation. It's a Snapchat generation. Quick, quick, quick. Everything quick. Get, get it done. You know, move really quick, fast, and get it all, all together. No way. No, that's not what life is. If you've seen all these things about getting, getting in life, becoming rich so quick, and becoming so, so famous so quick, and so on, so, this is not what life is about. Life is about taking it easy. Relationships are built over time and they take time to build. So what do you want to do? When, you, when you're first going out there, you're looking for someone to get married to, first make sure you find the right platforms to get married. There are right platforms, there are wrong platforms. The right platform is that you go through family members to find someone. You go through friends. You can go through your local imam. You can go through local masjids. I've been telling people to try and uh, open and try and create a database within every single masjid. That the masjid should become the, 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 very, the, very, um, the, the very piece of, of, of making, you know, the, the very foundation of making all these marriages happen. And the masjid's databases should be connected with other masjid, other masjids around. That would be the most wonderful way of, of, get, of us finding relationships and so on. But not every masjid is, is doing it. But I'm actually saying this. And I'm saying, I'm, this is going in the recording as well. If you're a masjid committee member, all right, what you should do is you should try and get people to have their profiles with you in the masjid, okay? You don't need to keep photos. Don't, you don't need to keep any photos. You just need to know uncle so-and-so wants his daughter to get married, that's it. And uncle so-and-so wants his son to get married. So what do you say? You say, uncle, you talk to that uncle. This uncle talk to this uncle, that's it, all right? If, they, if the two uncles in the masjid, they kind of click and they say, okay, they can move forward with all of this. If not, then they can just end it there. There's no need of all these other you know, things that you need to do. Anyway. If that is not possible, okay, and you can't get it done through family, friends, or whatever, some people turn online, all right? Now, online, there is a world of you trying to find a spouse, okay? There is a world, and there's a genuine world. However, most of the matrimonial services out there, the Muslim ones, 
okay, are plagued with people that are not serious. They're not serious about marriage. That is, that is the fact. Only about 30% of people on those sites are serious about marriage. So in this case, I'm going to ask the sisters to please, more than the brothers. Brothers, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your deen anyway. But the sisters are more vulnerable, all right, in this in regards. And we know that. We know the sisters become more vulnerable. So I'm going to ask the sisters, please put your mahram's number on your profile, that this is the contact number. Call my dad. My dad's going to pick up the phone. My older brother is going to pick up the phone. Let the guy know this. Because if he then calls and he starts, you know, wanting to flirt or whatever, and your dad's on the floor, phone, he's going to go, hello, how are you? Hello. Okay, please. You know what I'm saying? He's going to get the message. If he thinks that, he's going to just chat to you. And sisters need to also protect yourself. Why? Because you're going to think, well, it's a bit of adventure. It's fine. I can talk to him without my dad's, you know, uh, without my dad's contact, without him coming in between. I can have my, um, my, my uh, bro brother on the side. I'll use them when I want. But you're now going to danger. Because what happens next is the brothers... Okay, that are on there, some of them are not serious. They just want to just wanna mess around with you. I just want to get you in a place where it's haram. Okay, and not only the brothers are messing around, now I'm getting a lot of reports, sisters are messing around. Right, this was, this is in the new day and age. Sisters are messing around. They're coming on these sites and they're asking, you know, they're saying, yeah, let's just go. Let's just go and see each other. Next stop is Costa Coffee. Next stop is a coffee shop. Next stop, stop is going to be in a place where it's all right, it's all right. And they justify it. They say, you know what, it's all justified. How? They say, you know what, we're in a public place. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. you're in a public place, are you? Yeah, but what about your private conversation on that table? It's private. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has told us, no man gets together with a woman in secrecy except shaitan is the third amongst them. All right? You might be in a public place, but you're on a, I know you're on a, you're on a table that is that is that, that is in a public place but your table is private your conversation is private and therefore it's not allowed to be there what should happen is that if you want to have a conversation if you want to and you should get to know each other and try and find out about each other before marriage but it's supposed to be with your mahram with the sister's father there or her older brother someone who's who's going to who's going to prevent the loose talk from happening it's for your own protection my sister and it's for your protection, my brother, because next thing you know, Zina is around the corner. From that, from that Costa coffee shop, from that coffee shop, next thing, they're going to, you know, they're going to go to a hotel. It starts from the lobby of the hotel, then it ends up somewhere else. You know, they're going upstairs, you know, like, they're going, they're going to something, which, and the thing is, they might justify. They might justify, they're like, we're not going to touch each other, we're not going to do anything. But you know what? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has already told us how, how it all happens, okay? In a Sahih Hadith of Muslim, he's told us that the ears commit zina by wanting to listen. The, eye, the first he said the eyes. The eyes commit zina by wanting to see. Then it's the ears that want to listen. Then it's the tongue that wants to talk. And that's a small zina that happens, a small fornication of the tongue, tongue that happens. Then he said about the feet that want to walk and the hands that want to touch. And then after that, he said the actual zina that is there. And this is something that is happening. I want to tell you from real stats out there. It was taken from American uh, youngsters and, and Canadian youngsters in a real research, you know what? Two out of three of them have already committed zina before marriage, right? And this is not far away from the UK. The stats won't be far away from the UK. It's very, very sad that this is happening. Now, you want to get married? Yes. But please protect your akhirah more than anything else. You don't want to go to the akhirah with the debt of a sin of zina. Because what happens is this. You get to the Akhirah, you've got two things that will happen. And please notice that the Akhirah is going to have one of two things for you. It's either going to have straight up punishment or it's going to have straight up rewards and bl a blissful life. One of the two, you don't get nothing in between. Right? In, a, in a long hadith of Bukhari, the Prophet wasallam saw a dream with Jibreel salam, and he saw a whole huge pot and that pot had fire inside it. There were naked men and women inside it. They were being burnt so fiercely that they were being tossed up and coming back straight into the pot, tossed up and into the pot. And they're screaming, they're screaming. And the Prophet ﷺ later on inquired, what did I see here, Jibreel? Jibreel ﷺ said, these are the men and the women of your ummah that have committed zina, that have committed the haram act, okay? Now, 
What's the opposite? And I'm telling you, there's going to be people here sitting here right now who've got haram relationships going on. There's a simple thing. It's either black or white in the akhirah. Either you're heading for punishment or you're heading for this other side, which is what? Which is that the Prophet ﷺ has told us that on the day of judgment, a person who said in the world, who was in the world, and he had a woman who said to him, come on, let's do it. A woman of, of beauty, a woman of good lineage. She said, come on, let's do it. And he said, inni akhafullah, I fear Allah. Or she did that with a man. She said, I fear Allah. And they never went to that act. Because of that, Allah will call them on the day of judgment. He will put them under his throne on the day of judgment. The only shade that exists on that day. And they will be honored in the presence of the Prophet So you choose which pathway you want to go to. If you have had a haram relationship, if you've done something haram, you better do tawbah. Just seek forgiveness because it's very serious once you die. So don't risk it just, just for a biscuit. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, just for a biscuit, don't risk it. Okay? So now, one of the things that young people say is this Well, I'm not ready for marriage. I'm not ready for marriage. What do you mean you're not ready for marriage? Are you, and you've got to ask yourself a question What position are you in? Are you, have you got a need for marriage? Right? So answer that question first. Have I got a need for it? Do I really need to sleep with, my, with the opposite gender? That's a need, okay? Do I have that? Well, if it's a yes, you need to get married. If it's a no, okay, you can probably delay for a little longer. Am I able to financially, for the man, am I able to financially look after this person I'm getting married to? If it's a yes, then you have to get married. You've got a need and you've got the money. It's far for you to get married to that woman now. It's far for you to find a woman and get married to her because you're going to go towards haram. Have I got the financial means to look after the woman? No. Then you, then you better now start to look for the financial means or try your best to find something where you can convince a family, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Well, you know, there can be situations where they can help you as well. And I want to tell this to the parents that are over here. Just because a guy comes over and he doesn't have a job, right current job but he's got a degree you know that he's going to be able to work it doesn't mean you say no to him straight away if he's got a, if he's got good deen if he's got good religion if he's got a good background because musa alayhi salam according to surah qasas he was on his journey uh, running away from fir'aun he comes across these two women long story the father-in-law who is the who, who is his, sorry his future father-in-law he suddenly calls him over and then his daughter gives a sign that she wants you know she wants, the she wants the father to employ him. The father understands that, the, that his daughter wants to marry Musa alayhi salam. And the father to a jobless man who's on the run. But he sees good qualities in this man. He sees that he's a man of good values. He's a prophet, obviously. Um, oh, so he's going to become a prophet, sorry. He's gonna be, at that moment, he wasn't a prophet. But he saw good qualities in him. Straight away, he said, he said to Musa alayhi salam, he said, how about if I employ you and, and you, can, you can marry one of my daughters and in return, basically, you're going to work for me for a few years. And the deal, the deal was sealed, right? It's in the Quran. The Quran is telling us, like, when you see a good person come along, help them. Help, no, you've seen a good person. What does a good person mean? A good person does not mean that they've got, you know, a good look, okay? Some of you dumb dumbs don't understand that. I'm sorry. It's going to have to be said like that. A good thing doesn't mean they've got a nice, beautiful face, which most of us die for. Oh my God, look at him, how cute he looks. And the men are like, hey, hey, she's mine, yeah? She's mine, you know what I'm saying? That's going to be my wife, you know, that's going to be my wife. That's, the whole thing is about looks. And the thing is that you guys don't even understand is that online, when they put their photos on, it's manipulated. It's enhanced. Samsung does a very good job. It makes you look better than what you are. You take a photo with a Samsung phone, with a, one of the latest Samsung phones, right? You take a photo, you look at it, you, huh? Is that me? You get so happy and then you look in the mirror and you get depressed. Because the photo makes you look better. And you know what you do? You guys do, you young people, you put that photo on, that's it. The guy's gonna see me, and when he sees me, he's gonna fall in love with me. Uh. Wait till he sees your real self. That's the real thing. Honestly, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Like, honestly, please do yourself a favor. Don't put so much expectation with your image online. Put a nice photo, a real photo. Be real with yourself. Because you got certain cases when the guy actually sees you without any, you know, without anything on your face, without any enhancement, whatever. The guy's going to be probably like, what in the world? Like, seriously? You're not even her sister, the one that I saw. 
You know, like you don't even look close. Honestly, seriously, I had one case, one case from the Midlands, a real case, right? They, they, they found their daughter-in-law to be daughter-in-law, right? The, the mother and the sister, they even took her out for shopping, everything. They wanted to really just see her. She was so nice, everything. She looks really nice, beautiful, all of that kind of stuff, yeah? Very nice. They did that before marriage. After that, they got married. And then after the night of the marriage, when that woman who just got married was coming down the stairs early in the morning, the family thought someone broke in the house. <laughs> Their family looked at the, who's that? Now, sister, I'm going to tell you, my sisters, look, we love you for the sake of Allah. But you've got to understand, there is a real you and there's a different you. And with the men as well, I've heard, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Some men are also using that foundation, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. What's wrong with you guys, man? Seriously. But there's a real you, my sister. And the, you want your man to fall in love with the real you. Who the real you is. Because once he does that, whenever you use makeup after that in front of him, he's going to love you even more. Right? But when you, when you start off with so much makeup on, and then you want him to fall with this face of the makeup face, then he's fallen in love with this face that took you two hours to make. Some of you don't want to admit it. True or not, go and tell me. <laughs> admit it, true or not. Some women have to spend 40 minutes on that face. Some women, 60 minutes. Some women, more than that. And the more they work on it, you know, they could, they could do certain things to that face, which you're going to be like, wow. Like, they can make a blunt nose look sharp through makeup. And the women are laughing. They know what I'm talking about. They exactly know what I'm talking about. They can make, you know, a, a woman without high cheekbones look like she's got high cheekbones. They can make her look like she's got a thin chin. But you know what? Her chin's the same, but she just used makeup in a way that you just look at her and you think that she's got a you know, thin chin. Next morning, you wake up, she's got a blunt nose, she's got a big chin, and she's got no cheekbones, and you look at her and you think, mm -hmm. And guys, look, you got to also do the same thing as well, right? Be honest with yourselves. If you got a pot belly here, yeah, you got a pot belly, bro. Okay? Don't try and like... You know, some guys, they, they love it. You know, on the picture, on the phone, like that. Hey, hey, quickly, quickly, take the photo, quickly. My guy, be honest with yourself, man. You want to make you make think that you got some kind of six pack down there, right? And then the day, the day she gets married to you, after that, she sees that pop belly. She kind of thinks that I didn't, I didn't sign up to marrying Santa Claus, right? Father Christmas in bread. I didn't, I didn't sign up to that. Okay, now, come on. If, you, if you've got the means to look after her, if you've got a need, you must get married. Same with the sister. If you've got a need that you need to be with a man, you know when the time comes. Then it's time for you to be with the man. Now, what do you do? Well, you're going to try and go for the means of trying to find the person. Okay, let's say fine. Let's say fine. You found the person. You've got your mahram involved, all right? Now, you're going to ask your questions. Now, when you ask these questions, what are the questions you're supposed to ask? What are the questions you're supposed to ask? Because most people... They muck this up. They go like, they sit there, they go like, um, do, do you practice your deen? And the guy goes, yeah, I practice my deen. Yeah. You guys, man, honestly, seriously, TikTok generation, Snapchat generation, few seconds, you get all the information. Is that the question you're going to come up with? Do you practice your deen? Yes, I practice my deen. That's it. Can you just explain that a little bit? Most people get whacked in the face after marriage when, they, when they've asked this question before marriage. They didn't even know what hit them. You know when you ask someone, do you practice your deen? That could mean, do you practice your deen once a week? Of course I do. I go to Juma. Do you practice your deen? Yeah, I've got a hijab on my head. I wear this hijab when I want. It's similar to a BMW 6 coupe that has a convertible. You're like, you know, it goes up and down. You know what I'm saying? And you find out later on that she doesn't even wear the hijab often. And she finds out that he, she asked him a question. She said, do you pray your five daily prayers? And he goes, he goes yeah, I do. I struggle with my fajr sometimes. But he said five daily prayers. You know what that means? He prays five daily prayers when he wants. Right? And then sometimes he's missing, missing isha. Sometimes he's doing it, sometimes not. Right? You want to ask a different type of question. You don't want to get into a yes or a no. You know what you want to ask? You want to ask? You want to ask the brother, 
all right, if you want to ask about his salah, you say, and you will be ready for the same question coming to yourself as well. You say, how many prayers have you missed in your life? Right? Since you became, you know, since we get to the age of that we have to pray. The same, or you can start with yourself. You can say, well, I missed this many prayers, but I've been making up for prayers. And now I've been praying all my salahs since this time. Now that's a different type of a way of, of knowing a person. Because now you've got a history. If you want to know about the sister, you don't just say, oh, you just wear hijab. No. How long have you committed to wearing hijab all the time? How long? How long? Come on. This is history. Are you guys with me? Yes or no? Come on. Some of you are like, shake, you're exp exposing me. Shake, you give. Yeah, but this is the truth. You don't want to get into something where tomorrow you're going to be like fighting one another because you thought he gave this answer. And you thought practicing deen means that he's practicing deen. What I had in my head of practicing deen, he had something different. Well, it happens all the time. So you better start explaining things. You better start asking questions that have got scenarios. I'll give you another one to do. Instead of asking the guy, you know, sometimes they ask these questions. Do you get angry? What do you think the guy's gonna say? Yes, yeah, sister, you know, when I get angry, yeah, my veins pop, right? My eyes are big, like, you know, you know? You read the story about the little red riding hood here and the wolf? Well, that's me, the wolf. And you're gonna be little red riding hood on the run. What, what do you think? He's gonna tell you that? No, he's not. So what do you do? How do you ask the question about anger? I'll tell you how you do it, because everyone gets angry. Sisters included, yes or no, go on. Uh, just a few sisters said that. The rest of you, <laughs> astaghfirullah al <-Azim. laughs> right? Man, we've got different ways of getting angry, okay? Now, we all get angry. We've all got angry at some point of our lives. It's a, it's a thing inside you. You have to get angry. If the guy says that he never gets angry, the girl says, I never get angry, they're lying to you. So what you say is this. You say, I'm going to tell you a story about one thing that really made me angry the most in my life. And then I want you to share a story as well. And you tell your story. That's how you do it. That's, just, that's really good. You're, you're opening up. Right? Pick emotions. Talk about happiness. Say, I'm going to tell you about one of the happiest moments in my life. And I'm going to tell you this, the, why I was happy and what happened and so on. I'd like you to do the same as well. Brilliant. Now you're working on emotions, good and bad, and you're bringing it out. I'm going to tell you a moment I felt jealous in my life. All right? I shouldn't have done it, but you know, I'm just going to tell you. I hope you can share one as well. But I'm never jealous. Uh, never, never felt anything inside you. Or, or I want you to tell me a moment in your life where you felt sad. Why did you feel sad? What happened? I want to I wanna tell you about an argument in my life that happened. And I was in this particular argument, and this is what happened, Robert. Can you tell me one as well? So that, now, now look, you're now opening scenarios. It's not a yes or no question. Are you guys with me, yes or no? Come on, some of you are still getting on the bandwagon that I'm talking about. Let me give you another one, okay? Another good way of, of opening up is to talk about your life in chapters. Okay, so you say, my life, I'm going to divide it into chapters. I want you to do the same thing, right? So chapter one is going to be every time, chapter one or one chapter is going to be when I moved from my early memories of primary school to secondary school, that's one chapter, right? Chapter one is my primary school. Chapter two is my secondary school. Chapter three is going to be my college life. Chapter four is going to be my university life. Okay, that's a set of chapters. I've got another chapter I'm going to say, which is every time I moved houses, okay? This is one house I moved to another house, that's a separate chapter. Then I moved from that house to this area, separate chapter. And I'm going to also tell you every time someone came in my family, newborn baby, this is another chapter. Every time somebody left the family, that's another chapter. These are brilliant chapters in life. Everyone's got those chapters. Now what you do is you go into those chapters and you start describing those chapters. You talk about the friends you had in those chapters. You talk about the memories you had in those chapters. And some people get so much in love with the person, they can't see anything beyond just that person. Yes or no? Yes. Right, and you better not be blind because Rasulullah told us, he said, He said, your love for something can blind you. It can blind you sometimes, okay? So don't be in that position. You want to ask questions, you want to get to the bottom of who? You want to get to the person inside. Guys, wake up. You want to know who am I living with? You tell me this, guys. Tell me this here, and you tell me girls, right? If you had a man, I'm asking any woman here, you had a man, the guy's, mashallah, he's perfect. He's got the muscles, he's got the six pack, he goes to the gym, he regularly works out, he's got the financial status, he's got, he's got all that, all that, he's got the money, he's got the looks, he's, he looks Prince Charming, okay? So already some of you are like, you know, smiling, you're like, yeah, 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 that's my kind of guy, right? Now you get married to him. 
after you get married to him, he treats you like trash. He doesn't give you his money. He's stingy with you. He talks to you rudely. Is he a nice guy anymore? Yes or no? God, tell me. Thank you. Was he a nice guy before that? Yes or no? Yes, he was. And don't lie to me. You were looking and thinking, that's my guy. Hey, hey, hey. You agwaista. Hey. Don't move forward, yeah? Guys, tell me this. A woman, right? Beautiful from top to bottom. You look at her and you melt. You're like, she's my Barbie. Not Barbie, but Barbie. You know what I'm saying? Right? And she's the woman. I'm going to make her mine. I'm going to do everything for her. She's got the figure. She's got the looks. She's got the charm. She's got the walk. She's got the beautiful, the soft voice and all of that. Once you get married to her, her tongue becomes a machete. She chops you all, bro. Bro, you don't even need anyone to do your islah or tarbiyah anymore. No one needs to, like, no one needs to, like, you don't need to go to a sheikh and say, sheikh, you know, do my islah or rectify my bad deeds. You don't need to do that. This woman doing all of that every single day. And you're like, you're like, yeah, when I go home, I get such a telling off. I feel like I'm a school kid in, in class getting told off my teacher. Or I feel like I'm in prison and I'm in front of a prison guard. Is that woman beautiful anymore? Yes or no, guys, tell me. Yes or no? Half of you said no. See how thick they are? <laughs> Half of them said no. What's... Come, give me a proper answer, man. Yes or no, guys? No, no thank you. Right? You're not going to like that person anymore because that person has basically spoiled all your dreams. It's not about the charms on the outside. You're going live... you're, you're to live with the person inside. Inside. And you better, with this questioning, you better find out who that person is. Imam ibn Qayyim al Jawziya said a wonderful thing. He said, All people are equal until they speak. Once they speak, they start telling you who they are on the inside. So, in all your questioning, your idea is to try and find out who the person is on the inside because you're going to be living with that person for the next 40, 50, 60 years. So, you better start asking the right questions and looking beyond their looks and the outside and getting to the inside. Anyway, I'm going to pass it over to Brother Hassan, and then we'll I'll come straight back after. I want everyone to stay where you are, please. I'm going to be here as well for the entire duration. As soon as, they, as, soon as Brother Hassan has finished, then I'm going to be back uh, on stage again. And we're going to have a second session where we've got a lot more to discover, a few more things to discover before marriage, but there's going to be a lot more. How do you stay married? How do you make that marriage last for good? Even though you've got your differences uh, and, 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 and you've got your you know, difference of opinion or you've got your little arguments. So how do you make that marriage last? We're going to discover all that. There's going to be Q&A, extended Q&A session today, inshallah. So till then. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een Welcome back again and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Right, we're going to get right back into where we left from You're looking to find the person who's on the inside, not on the outside only Yes, you want beauty, there's nothing wrong for you to get in beauty Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us that, that most people like, they'll look for one of four things, okay? So they're going to look for beauty. It doesn't mean that you find the religion and you don't find the beauty. It doesn't mean that. Look for at least beauty that is nice to you, fine. But religion must be something which you give priority to. Don't miss out on that. And I'm going to tell you why. A lot of people suffer later on because of these wrong choices. Have a beautiful person, but have religion with it. Have a person with wealth but have the religion with it. What's the point of you having wealth if you don't know, have religion? Honestly, what are you going to do? You're going to destroy yourself. I was telling a businessman the other day, a businessman the other day, I said, listen, bro, I said, you're trying to make the millions, fine, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you. Right? May Allah bless you with the millions. But if you don't have taqwa, if you don't have God consciousness, then that money will ruin you. That money will take you to ways that, you know, to areas that you never wanted to go in your life. But the money will take you. Why? Because you've got no fear of Allah inside you. You've got no consciousness of Allah inside you. You do not want a man in your life who's got money who doesn't have Allah in his heart. Honestly, I'm telling you, it will, it will lead you to a lot of problems. You do not want a woman with money. Because some guys, honestly, I know one guy, yeah? He actually is up from north, yeah? He's not getting married. I said, why are you not getting married, bro? He goes, because I'm waiting for the rich sister. Boy, <laughs> You know, like, guy doesn't want to work. You know what I'm saying? Like, he wants to hang around. Honestly, for years, every time I ask him, he doesn't want to get married. Why? Because he's looking for a rich sister. 
rich sister who's going to basically ch- you know people think that money solves everything money does not solve everything anyway if Allah's blessed you with wealth alhamdulillah may Allah bless you more there's nothing wrong in having wealth but you better have the deen okay if you don't have the deen if you don't have religion you're going to take yourself to destruction now the third thing Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said he said lineage people look for lineage like this family noble family this family yes it's all good have a good family, have a good background, but don't sacrifice the fourth one, the most important one, which is religion. And when we get to religion, what is religion? Is religion when you pay, pray five times a day? No, it's not. Religion doesn't stop there. Religion doesn't stop at the hijab. Religion is inside. It's a state of the heart. Okay? When you have religion inside you, you're religious in every single setting. It's not just, you know, when, when other people see me that I'm religious. No. It's not just for, you know, just a few salahs, oh yeah, I've ticked the boxes. No, it's not that. You're religious from the inside. You're religious wherever you are, wherever you go. And you've got you to gotta ask those questions to understand. So what kind of questions are you going to ask? You know the questions you want to ask? When, you, when you're seeing a prospect, you want to ask the question, which masjid do you go to? What's, what's the masjid you frequently go to? Which sheikh do you, do you listen to online? And now you get into some things because now if they say, I listen to this sheikh, that sheikh, that sheikh, it gives you an idea of the person mentality. Then you say to the person, okay, what are the favorite quotes you've heard from the shuyukh, right? Now we're getting into proper fights, you know what I'm saying? Like before marriage, like not after marriage, bro, you know what I'm saying? Before marriage, ask these questions, what are the favorite quotes of a sheikh? Now, if she says, my favorite sheikh, my favorite sheikh is so-and-so, and he said, you know, when a husband comes home, he cleans all the dishes for me, and does everything in the house, and he looks after things, he's my favorite guy. My favorite quote, yeah? You listen to that, bro, yeah? All right? Basically, you're going to be, if you love that, bro, if you love that, alhamdulillah, go for it. Honestly, there's some men who like this. Honestly, there's one talk I gave, I think it was in the Midlands somewhere, and the brother, you know, put his hand up. He said, I happily do all the chores of the house. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Good. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feek. You know, may Allah bless you. But there are men who don't want to do that. And there are women who want that done. Now, you better start talking about this in front of the mahram, as I said, in front of that father, father figure, in front of that, you know, the brother is uh, the older brother of hers who's there to prevent the loose talk. You want to ask these questions because there are different sets, uh, there are different mindsets that we have. You better get to know those mindsets before you get into that marriage. Now, a very beautiful thing you can do, all right? A very beautiful thing you can do is to ask a separate, another way of finding the character. You want to find the inside of the person, right? I've been talking about this and I hope you can take this um, to yourself, do this test yourself. It will only take you 12 minutes to do this test, all right? The site is called 16personalities.com. Okay, 16personalities, T-I-E-S at the end, dot com. You basically go there at the right hand, crop right hand corner, there's a test, take the test. It will take you 12 minutes, answer it according to who you are now. Don't answer it according to who you want to be. There are no right answers, there are no wrong answers. Right? You answer according to how you actually are right now. In the end, it will give, give you four letters. Those four letters will describe who you are. The other person will also take the test, they'll get four letters now. After you get the four letters, you have to read the profile they're going to give you. They're going to give you about seven pages of profiles. You have to read it. You have to read it. And then you have to say to yourself, do I agree with 80%, roughly 80% of what they're saying about me? And if it's true, then that's you. That's who you are. If it's less like 60%, 65%, then it might not be you. You probably took the wrong, like you, you answered it wrongly. Okay, so you might not be that person. Now, once you've both got your results, what you want to say, you want to say, look, I am, for example, you can say, I am like ISTJ. And the other person will say, I am ENFP or something. Now, you both got four letters now. It will bring a profile. Those profile will tell you stuff about you, which you're going to look at. You're going to say, say, wow, how did they describe me that well? Now, there's going to be good and bad on both sides. Don't worry about it. There's going to be strengths. There's going to be weaknesses. Now, this is a very good platform for both of you to talk about who you really are on the inside. There are people who love to be extroverts. There are people who love to be introverts, right? There are people who love to chat. And there are people who don't like to chat. They like to sit in a library all day. They like to sit indoors with a book, all right? There are other people who like the outdoors. They like adventure. Now imagine the both of you are different and you've got together and you're trying to get married. Everything else looks good, but you know what? You don't like to chat so much. I remember once, subhanAllah, you know, this was very, very uh, early on in my marriage. 
One day, my wife brought her friend home, okay? And her friend came home. She's going to stay for a night or two in her house, fine. Uh, it was a university friend, okay? Early in my marriage, okay? And then the friend had some Islamic questions he wanted to ask me. So then she started to ask me these questions. Okay, I sat there. My wife's there. She's there. Okay, she's asking me these questions. She's chatting. She's there. And this woman, honestly, she knows how to talk. Mashallah. Okay? Alhamdulillah. Honestly, I've never, you know, seen that much talk. Like, she talks and she talks and she talks. And, and she had a good pitch to her voice as well. She talks. And I, I'm a guy, uh, most of you might think that I'm, I'm an extrovert because I do these bayans, right? I'm actually an introvert. I'm actually the opposite, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm listening and I'm listening and I'm listening and I'm listening. After maybe, I don't know, it was maybe over an hour, maybe near to the one and a half to two hours, right? I actually excused myself. I went upstairs and I went to bed because I had a headache. <laughs> I had a headache. When that guest left, I said to my wife, subhanAllah, I said, I won't ever be able to live with such a person like that. SubhanAllah, like that. That's, that's a lot for me. You know what I'm saying? And imagine if I was married to such a person, right? Imagine I was married to such a person. And that person is saying all of that and I'm getting headaches every day. I'm like, wow, you know, just give me the panel room, man. Just give me the power seat. Board. And imagine that person, how are they going to feel? Like this guy doesn't want to talk as much as I want to talk. It's frustration with frustration. So the thing is, though, these questions are going to bring out a character type. Discuss the character type. There are certain people who like to brush problems under the carpet. There are other people who like to talk about it straight on the face. Are you this type of person? Are you that type of person? You gotta, you gotta look at this type. There are so many different type of people out there. Now, this 16personalities.com, honestly, I've given this to so many brothers and sisters and over the years, it's helped a lot of them. It's helped a lot of them. In fact, what I've done is I've said, before you get married, bro, sister, just do the test and then look for it. Because if you go to the internet, you can actually put your po profile in there. Let's say, for example, your ENFJ. You put that in and you say, what's the most compatible person with this? And a lot of sites might have some differences, but you're going to see a common thing about this type would be the best for you or that type would be the best for you. And you know what? There are even certain sites out there that actually incorporate, Muslim sites incorporate all of this. Uh, and even if they don't, you can ask the person, you know, get this done and we can basically see how compatible we are. And you can end up in forums on the net. They've got forums, cafes, personality cafes, where they talk about this, like I'm an ENFP and this is an INFJ and we stayed together for this many years and these were the few problems we had and this is how we ironed it out. Or we had a bus stop and this is the reason why we had a bus stop. There's so many things to go through. SubhanAllah, it's like an ocean of stuff that you can go through just by your personality types. Now, on top of that, what you're going to do is you're going to make, you're going to do istishara. One is istikhara, one is istishara. What's istikhara? Istikhara is the two rakats you do and then you say the, the famous dua, okay? Just go to the internet, just look it up. You see the dua, you make the dua and after that you basically wait for, you know, some kind of result. Now, results are going to differ. I've actually got a whole talk on istikhara. I recorded, it's about two and a half hours of recording. Inshallah, it'll be up. I'm chasing the guy who recorded it. And inshallah, it's going to be up for you guys. But very briefly, okay, very briefly, <clears throat> istikhara, uh, the results of it is, you could wait for a dream, to see a dream. After those two rakats and the dua you read, you could wait for a very strong feeling the next morning. You could wait, you could wait for, and I wouldn't go for feelings really, but you could wait for a good sign. Now the signs come in very various different ways. You could, after your istikhara, you might see things are, things are actually going in the direction of you getting married to that guy and it's getting easier and easier. That's a very good sign. Or things are getting more difficult to get married to that guy. And that's a sign that you should probably, you know, back off. You could get a sign where someone suddenly says something to you and it's exactly what you needed to hear to make that decision. And most of all, with the istikhara, you have to have istishara. What does that mean? That means you have to have consultation. You have to, with your istikhara, go and consult. Now, who do you consult? You don't consult someone in your household who says to you, Beta, you need to get married, you know? Say, yeah, yeah, yeah I need to get married. But you know, you're looking here that we already have your wife for you. Huh? You already have my wife? Where is she? Yes, she is fantastic. She is lovely. She will do everything for you. She loves you already. You're like, what? She loves me. Yes, she's been waiting for you. Waiting for me? How long? Many, many years. Many years. What? Where? Where is she? Who is she? She is your cousin from Pakistan. <laughs> 
right? And you see that coming your way, right? And you're like, wow, what in the world? Who did I just consult here? Yes, better, don't get married to that one. Now, this other one that you want to get married to, she's compatible with you. She knows your, you know, she's, she's, she's partly Pakistani, partly, you know, British, and partly she's got the mentality of the culture over here. Because, you know, you want to you wanna blend with someone, so you're, you're kind of close to this one, but no better, no better. The one in Pakistan is given by God. It is given by Allah, you must do that. You know, you consult such people who are already biased, you're not going to get anywhere. Now, who should you consult? You should consult someone who is not biased. So let me give you a hadith. Take this right. Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. A woman, Fatima bin Qais, radiallahu anha, she comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and she takes, she consults. She says, Messenger of Allah, I have got two men who have proposed for me. One man is Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, and the other man is Abu Jaham, right? Which one of those should I marry? Right? Now look, get a hold of this. A woman, Sahabiyyah, coming to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Two men have proposed to me. Which one should I ask? Now you're going to say, wow, the Prophet is going to say, go for either that guy or this guy, right? Right? And you're like, Ooh. yeah, no, that's not what happened. This is our Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's saying, and I want you to concentrate on the, on the answer. It's, an, it's amazing. Where's the hadith? It's in Bukhari and Muslim. It's authentic. By agreed upon authentic. You know what he said? He said, as for Muawiyah, for Sa'luk, he said, Sa'luk, he has no money. So if you want to get married to a guy with no money, that's fine. But I'm just telling you, you consulted me, he has no money. And as for Abu Jaham, he doesn't take the stick down from his, from his shoulder. What does that mean? He's a wife beater. So if you want to get married to Abu Jaham, then go. He's going to beat you up, basically. So you make the choice. Now I can see your face, your face like, ah, oh my God, is that what the Prophet said? Yes. Now this hadith teaches us so much. One is the Prophet ﷺ gave us permission to talk honestly about someone behind their back when someone comes, someone else comes for a marriage proposal. You have to be honest about the character. This is not ghiba. This is not backbiting. You have to be honest about the character or about the situation. Now, anything wrong with Muawiyah? No. Just the fact that he just doesn't have much money. So if you're if you're happy for a life with a good man and less money, then fine. The other man has got money. You understand? Yeah, some of his sisters are, <laughs> should I go for him? <laughs> the other man has got money, but he's going to beat you up. That's what the Rasulullah is indicating. He's got the money, but he's going to beat you up. Now you make a choice which way you want to go, right? Subhanallah. And the next thing is that, what does it say? Is it wrong for you as a woman to go for a man who's got money? No, there's nothing wrong with that, but just don't become a gold digger. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Because some women, they want to go for the money and it's just the money that they're after. Now that's bad. Some men, all they want to go for is they want to go for the service of the woman, not for the woman. That's bad, my friend. All right? Both equally, I'm telling you that's bad because some women, they're just fixed on those dollars. They have dollars in their eyes. They have pounds in their eyes. The guy's going to give me this. They have a fantasy. Okay, I'm going to, oh yeah, I'm going to live like this. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have that. I'm going to have that. And some men are like, yeah. That woman, she's going to become my wife. She's going to do this, do that, do that for me, do that for me. And I don't care. She just does all that for me and I live my life. It's wrong. Now, you better understand what you're getting into. But most importantly, this hadith tells us that, you know what? you got problems on both sides. Which way are you going to go? What are you going to choose? Okay. So now, you consult the right people and your consultation has to be with the people who know them. Look, Rasulullah knows both of these men and that's who you go to, someone who knows them. Rasulullah is a senior figure in the community and of course he's our Prophet But you can go to a senior person, you can go to someone who knows uh, the, those people but most importantly you want to know their situation so that you know tomorrow what's going to be your case. Okay, now. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you, please, and please have this in your thing to do, all right? You cannot have too many things on your list you're looking for in the other person. If you, the more you have on your list, the worse it's going to be for you. I want you to start off with, with however many you want. You can start with 13 things I want, or 12 things, or 11 things I want in a person. Start, write them all down, all right? Then I want you to do this. Be honest with yourself. Say, why have I got 10? Well, I've got 10 things. Who gave me the idea of these 10 things? Who? Was it my friend? Am I looking at my friend because my friend has got such a nice husband? I want a husband like that. 
Is it my friend who has such a nice wife and, you know, she does all these things? I need that. Or my mom said this to me. Or my dad said this to me. Or my brother said this to me. Or this idea came from here or there. Please knock them out. These are not yours. They're not yours. I want to know what you need in person. Start knocking certain things off. Bring it down to seven. Bring it down to five. Bring it down to three. Three, I'm asking every person three things you must have in a person to get married. Those three things don't compromise, fine. Now ask yourself, three things I don't want in a person. You can start off with 11, start off with 10, and then come down to seven, to five, to three. Once you get to three, you have three things you must have in a person, and three things, any of these three things you must not have in a person. That's it, alhamdulillah, move on and look for your person because no one's perfect. Do you guys get that, yes or no? No, you didn't. That's why you didn't answer me. Look in the mirror today and say, you're not perfect. All right? You know what that means? You're not perfect. Did you get that, my brothers? Yes or no? Tell me. Brothers, yes or no? You see, it's hard for them to admit it, right? Sisters, yes or no? Uh, do you see that? There's so many sisters here. There's about less than a third of them that said yes. So many brothers, less than a third that said yes. You know, it's so hard to look at yourself and say, I'm not perfect. But that is, the, that is a fact. You're not perfect. He's not perfect. She's not perfect. We get married for life. You stay with the life. You stay with your whole life with the person, with all the goods and bads and everything. You take it in one package. And you stay till the end of your life with that person. You've got to make it through all the way. And it's not this, this thing that you're going to say, well, I didn't like it. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to stick with it. No. And another thing is this. You want to find, look, a lot of people ask this. What about if, what about if the sister is on a certain level of her deen or the brother is on a certain level of the deen, but, you know, they're going to, inshallah, improve in their deen, right? You know what I'm saying? Because I love them so much. You know, I'm just like infatuated, but I just don't want to admit that. Anyway. What about if they will, will get better in their deen, inshallah? Am I okay to marry them? I'm going to tell you, bro, that whatever level you accepted the sister, and sister, whatever level you accepted the brother of the deen, they're going to turn around to you tomorrow and say, I was accepted by, you accepted me on this level of the deen. So I can, I was told you I'm going to change, but I never told you when. You get, do you guys understand this or no? The guy said he's going to start praying his five daily salah. When? When? When is he going to do it? Well, yeah, he did it a little bit in the first year, then he dropped down a little bit. He's going to say, well, you accepted me without praying that many salah. Or the sister's going to say, well, you accepted me with this convertible hijab. You know what I'm going to say? Like, you know, you have some certain, certain cars that are, that are convertible, right? They go up and down. When the sun comes out, it goes down. When the, you, know, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? Like... BMW, Coupe, six, whatever, you know. Certain sisters, not, no, no offense to anyone, but certain sisters, that's how they live, okay? So that's their life. They're going to change it according to the environment. Now, if you've accepted her according to that, then she's going to say, you accepted me on this level, so therefore I'll make the move when I want to be more practicing in my own time. So you better t take that in consideration before you move on. Anyway, now, a lot of people want to ask about, you know, things about prayer, health, and so on. When it comes to health, right? Fine. If you're on a certain level of health, just, just ask the question about how have they maintained their, you know, their weight or whatever it is. If you're concerned about it, ask it. Ask, ask about it, right? And try and get to, like I said to you, scenarios. If you can get to scenarios or the chapters thing that I told you, it makes it easier for you to get to the bottom of things. Anyway, if you really want to get a bit, you know, if you really want to get into like debates before marriage, right? If you really want to push the gears up. Are you ready? Are you ready, yeah? Guys, are you ready? Yes or no? Yeah. Have I got all of them alive? Yes or no? Yes? Start asking, start asking controversial questions. Ask about COVID. Ooh, room's getting hot a little bit, yeah? Ask about the jab, you know what I'm saying? Like, ask about certain things that are very divided. There are certain things that have happened divided, all right? Brexit and so on, whatever it might have been, right? Ask about certain political situations. You're going to find out that there's a whole new set of things that comes out. Now, if you want to get also, if you want to ask, uh, you're going to get a little bit more, turn the heat on, right? Ask about the roles of the husband, roles of the wife. Ask the person, what do you see the husband's role in a marriage? What do you see the wife's roles in a role in a marriage? And then you get to the real thing. Now, this brings another thing, which is, 
When we talk about this, all these roles of the man, now we come to the next session now, which is how do you sustain a marriage, okay? Now, before I get into the roles of a man and roles of a man, I can see half of you already smiling. You're like, yo, shake, do it. Let's do it. Go there. Come on. Let's see. Tell us what we need to do, right? Before we get into that, I want to tell you that everyone who gets married, I'm not going to cover the part when you're actually getting married. I've got other lectures on the internet for that. If you want to know about how, you know, what to do on your nikah day and this and that. Oh, my days. Like people of all sorts, right? Sinifan. You know Sinifan? Where did that come from? Honestly, where, where did that, which hadith talks about Sinifan? Right? Which hadith talks about Gaya Hulud? Which hadith talks about Mendi? Uh, anyone tell me? Which hadith? Anyone? Hadith? Hadith of India? Hadith? Hadith of India? Yeah, yeah. That's where it all came, of, it came from. There's no such hadith, right? There's no such hadith. Now, guys, I'm going to cut it short. I'm going to cut it short. Please try and have a simple wedding. I've got a fantastic idea which I'm going to give to the world. I'm going to, inshallah, start it myself with my son, inshallah, and my children. Inshallah, say inshallah. inshallah. I'm going to save you guys a lot of money and I'm going to give the money back to you guys. Are you ready for this? Oh, come on, man. You guys are like, you're not even responding. Are you ready for this, guys? Yes. yes. And this is good for you. Young men, young women want to get married. And you want to have money as well. I'm giving it to you. This is what you do, right? You know our traditional marriages, they hire holes out. And they will have like a 10,000 pound like wedding, 20,000, 30,000, 40, up to 50,000, even more than that, on one day. Why is it costing you 50,000? It's because of all the decor. The, the chairs, you know those chairs you're sitting on right now? They cost three pounds with the, with the niqab on, with the hijab on. They cost you three pounds with the hijab off, looks a bit dirty, cost you less. Right, you know what I'm saying? Like these guys know how to make money, man. And you got, then, then you're going to have all your dishes, you're going to have this, that, you're going to have the limousine coming in. I don't know what people do, right? And they're going to have, they're going to have all the stage, they're going to have the, the people coming together with so much food and so on. And you're going to have this dish, that dish, that dish. Oh my God, and the chicken tikka and the biryani and this and the kebabs and whatever, and a sag alu, and you're going to have naans, you're going to have prata, and, and desserts, about three different ones. You're going to have a chocolate, chocolate fountain out there. And Allahu Akbar. You've just blown about 30 to 50,000 pounds in four hours. I'm going to give you a better idea. The better idea is this. And hopefully, inshallah, you will see the wisdom in this. Right? What you do is you hold that entire wedding in your house. Okay? Some people already laugh. Sheikh, my house is too small. Sheikh, Sheikh, don't even go there. Don't even go there. I'm like, wait, 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 come to I've got a house as well. Okay, let me tell you how it's done. All right? You're going to hire a marquee and cover your entire back garden. Just remove the khudu from the way. You know what I'm trying to say? You know, you know all the, you know, the tomato, tomato, khudu, aldu, and all that kind of thing that they're growing in the back garden. You might have to like just sacrifice that for one year or something. But anyway, anyway, Bengalis, they have to do that. They come to England and they have the back garden as a, you know, a bazaar. Anyway, that's good. That's good. Okay? I'm not saying it's bad. But anyway. You have a marquee, you cover it with a marquee. How many people can you get in the downstairs of your house and in the marquee? Maybe 50, maybe 50 max, okay? How many people do you need to invite? 300 people. When do you do the wedding? You do it over a long weekend. You start on a Friday night, you probably go all the way till Monday if you have to, or start on a Saturday, right? So long weekend, you know, you have a bank holiday weekend, okay? Three days, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. How many times are you gonna feed people? You're gonna feed people twice. Who's going to come for the food? Well, 50 people for, the, for lunch on Saturday. Different 50 people for a lunch on Saturday evening. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, make sure those people don't stay from the afternoon and eat twice. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah? Different 50 people on a Sunday afternoon. Different people on a Sunday evening. Monday, 50. Lunch and dinner, 50. Subhanallah, how much is that? How, how, many, how, much have a, how many people have a fed? Come on. Come on, guys. Don't run. You don't know maths, man. 300 people are just fed, bro. You're going to say, well, that's not fun. Right? 50. But listen, let me tell you what happens here. Look, you know, on the card of the wedding, what you write before they use, right now, they, use, they write things like no box gifts. The reason why they say no box gifts is because there was a time when everyone used to, used to uh, you know, rotate the same dishes around the whole town. So one guy gets some dishes. And then he doesn't know, he opens it, oh, there's another dish, he's wrapping it up again and giving it to the next wedding. Now, that's what they used to do. What you do on your wedding card is this. You say, we are saving 30,000 pounds or 25,000 pounds from this wedding. But the whole 25,000 pounds 
is going to be given to my daughter and my son-in-law or my son and my daughter-in-law for the deposit of their house. Now, is that a good idea? Tell me yes or no. Yes. Come on, guys. Guess or no? Yes. You guys don't even have the deposit of a house and they're blowing that money on your wedding day. Are you kind of crazy or something? You, your houses here cost £250,000, decent three-bedroom house, £300,000, and the prices are going up. And are you telling me that you're going to blow all that money out before you even get there? What, what is wrong with you now? If people say, no, I better have the full wedding, well, tell them to go somewhere else. Seriously. You know, are you dying for that chicken tikka? Right? You know what you're going to have on your menu for that wedding, by the way? You're going to have one dish. Just have one dish. One dish. If they complain and say, what's this one dish? Say, Allah only written for you one dish, bro. All right? Sister, there's only one dish written for you today. Just have the nice dish. Have the kulfi dessert, whatever, and bye-bye. Right? You know, Allah's written that for you because we're saving money for the future of our son and daughter. Now, if you don't want to give the, you know, deposit money for the mortgage and so on, what do you do? Hajj. Hajj now is about 10,000 pounds. Right? Give, say on the card, we're going to give it 20,000 pounds to our son and daughter. They can do the hajj on the first year. Now, tell me this, guys. Is that a good idea or not a good idea? Yes, right. If you like it, you're going to do it. Who's going to do it? Put your hands up. Right. I see some meager hands going up. Like, eh, eh. Seriously, man. I'm trying to give you your deposit money for your future house. And you're like, eh, four hours is better with chicken tikka and biryani, okay? And a whole hall full of all the chandeliers and everything that you want. Anyway, let's... Let's get, let's get moving on, right? You got married, okay? Everything's good. You have something called, subhanAllah, everyone who gets married, they have a period called the honeymoon period, right? Honeymoon period, if you don't know what it is, it brings a lot of smiles to your face, okay? It's the best period that you've got of your, mashallah, alhamdulillah. Everything's so wonderful. You look at her, you just see smiles and, you know, and she looks at you and it's all about, oh, this can just get better and better, right? Now, there comes a day when that honeymoon period comes, you know, it, it's over, okay? It's over. What actually happens, can, can the sister take the child, please? What hap happens is, there comes a day, it could, be a, a, uh, it could be a month later, it could be two months later, it could be a year later, whatever the case is, you will find that there comes a time when the honeymoon period is actually over. And when that is actually over, what happens is you see a whole different side. Right, come on, sister, please just come and say, take the child, please. Okay, that period lasts for you for a, for a nice long time. Now, I'm going to ask you guys, right, if, your honeymoon period, if you're married and your honeymoon period lasted for six months, like, 100, like basically everything's hunky-dory, everything's really happy. If you last for six months or more, put your hands up. Hands up. My God, you guys are so depressed over here, man. <laughs> I don't see one single hand up. What's wrong? For anyone, if it lasted for a month or more, put your hands up. I'm only getting two, three hands. Yeah, what do you guys do, man? I'm not saying honeymoon as in like you go on holiday for a month. I know you guys haven't left England yet. I'm not talking about that. I'm actually talking about your good days when you're like, you know, all very nice and happy. My God, I only see two hands, man. You guys, what? You're starting to fight from the first day or something? <laughs> now, let me ask seriously, come on. You know those happy days in the beginning of marriage? If you have had those happy days, hands up. Come on. Marshall, that's good. Now you're being honest. Now you're being honest, right? Good. Anyone's honeymoon period lasted for a year or more? Put your hands up. Mashallah. Good, good, good. That's good. That's good. Okay, now, now look. It can last for a long time. Now, one day, what you're going to do is one day you're going to wake up and you are going to have some kind of argument or some kind of disagreement with your spouse. It's natural. It's going to happen. I'm going to ask a question right now. Anyone who's basically been married for more than one year and never had a single argument with their wife or their husband, put your hands up right now. No one. No one, okay? Actually, actually, can you see that, right? Can you see that? There's going to be some kind of, some kind of thing. Now, I actually asked this question in the other talks that I did, and one guy put his hand up, right? One, one guy, and I said, this was just yesterday or something, and it looked like an elderly figure, and I said, uh, I said uh, brother, how long have you been married? He goes, 20 years. I go, I go you've never had an had a argument ever? He goes, tura, tura. 
a little bit, little bit alcohol. Bro, you can't put your hand up, right? You've had some kind of argument, right? Come on, you can't claim that. Anyway, there's another person who put their hand up. There's a woman from the background. She put the hand up as a sister. Do you speak the same language as your husband? Do you live in the same country? Like, or is it through Zoom? Basically, you know, you get these situations where it can happen for a year, it can happen for less or more. But Alhamdulillah, Allah Mubarak, may Allah bless all of you. May Allah give you long periods of happiness. Say, Amin. Right, but it's not going to always last. Now, what happens is, this is the truth. It's truth, because most of you never put your hands up, right? It's not going to last. I'm going to let me give you a story. And this story is going to tell you how to keep your marriage lasting nice for a long period of time. Okay? Without any arguments. Imam Ahmad bin Hamal rahimullah, he was married for, four, for, for 40 years. He was about 60 years old when his wife passed away. He cried. And his disciple said, Imam, why are you crying? He said, I've had a marriage with my wife, a marriage with my wife for 40 years, and we never had a single argument. A single argument. They said, how? He said, when we got married, I took it on myself, and I said to my wife, that if you're, if you're ever, you know, mad at me, or you're, you know, you're kind of angry at me, and you're saying things I don't like, I'm gonna take you on me to stay quiet until you've calmed down, and then we'll speak. And if, if I ever get mad at you, and if I say things to you that you don't like, you're gonna take it on yourself to stay quiet and zip yourself up until I calm down, and then we talk nicely. This is the recipe to make sure that you have a nice marriage. Inshallah, say inshallah. How many guys are gonna do that? Put your hands up. How many guys are gonna do that? Put your hands up. La hawla. La hawla. We had only a few hands that are just about struggling. Brother, you might, brother, whether you're lighting. Lighting, lighting. So the thing is, look, you wanna make it last long, I'm gonna tell you, brother, one day what's gonna happen is your wife is probably not gonna be in the best mood with you, or one day my sister, your husband's not gonna be in the best mood with you. Now, what do you do, brother, on that day? On that day, brother, you leave the house and you go to the masjid, you understand? You're gonna need the prayers, brother. You're gonna need them for yourself, you know what I'm saying? Go and kneel before the Lord, okay? Ask Allah to help you, because the sister, is only getting warmed up about you. She's only getting warmed up. If you come home and you see the sister waiting for you by the door, you better go back. You need to do more rakats in the masjid and come back. Maybe go to a friend's place, maybe go for a drive, maybe go for a coffee, whatever it is, but cool off. Cool off. Stay away. Sister, same thing. If your husband is you know, not, not, you know, he's not having a good mood towards you, then you better go to your own zone. Just zip up. The main thing is to zip up. Don't get into these arguments because what happens is when you are angry, you're not yourself. Is that correct? Yes or no? Yes. And you're going to say stuff which you wouldn't say stuff on a normal day. You're, you're fired up at this time. And all you want to do is hurt that person. All you want to do is hurt that person. And when you say things from your tongue and you hurt the person, huh? You said that to me? Huh? Wait till I start, start saying. And you know what? You start remembering all the negative memories, all the things that you're not supposed to have said, and you bring them from the bottom, and you're like putting, you know, you're, you're like throwing mud at each other's face. And that, that's the thing. What happens is after the, the storm has calmed down, you know what happens? You then realize the damage you caused. It's a storm. At that moment of anger, you're supposed to stay away. Don't talk to each other. Stay away. Just say, look, peace, peace. We're gonna stay. We're gonna stay. We're gonna stay away. We're gonna. We're not gonna say a word. And now, look, you're feeling it inside you. Like, I've gotta say something back. I've gotta say something back. Yesterday, we had a question. Okay, uh, this, I think I don't know if it was a brother or sister. They they gave a question. You know what the question was? I love winning an argument. What do I do? <laughs> I love. I have to have the last say in an argument. What do I do? La hawla wa la quwwata. That's that's like war, war. That's going to be dangerous. Now look, what do you do? You stay away from each other. Do you resolve the problem? Yes, you do. When? When you calm down. Once you calm down, you, you say to yourself, okay, let's calm down. Let's talk logic. Now bring logic into your, into your scenario. Talk about factual evidence. Talk about what happened. Try and get to the bottom of it from logic, not emotions. Emotions don't, 
get your problems sorted. They're going to make them worse. If you ha can't have logic, or if you can't get anyone to agree to logic, then get somebody senior. Only if you can't sort it yourselves. Best thing is, my friends, I'm going to tell you, try and sort your problems out as husband and wife. Don't involve anyone, especially in an Asian family, because Asian families love gossip. They love, they're like, yeah, what, what happened? What happened? He said this? Okay, I'm getting my vindaloo out. I'm getting my garam masala out. I'm going to cook you a nice meal now. They're going to stir, my friend. The worst thing you can do is start WhatsApping someone straight away when, when your husband has done something wrong to you or your wife has done something wrong to you. No way. You sort it out between yourself. Don't leave it too long. You say to yourselves, we're going to, we're going to talk about it, talk about it straight. And if you don't find that both of you can agree to the logic in front of you, then you get somebody senior, one person only, who's not biased, who's not going to take sides, a person who's senior, who's gone through married life, who knows what it's about, who's going to listen to both of you, who's going to sit down between you and say, okay, do this. And whatever that senior, you know, wise guy says, just take it from there and just involve only one person. That's it. There's only one person. Don't make it a thing that you have to involve a lot of people into your marital problems. No, because people just take the gossip and they make something else out of it. Anyway, my brothers, my sisters, you're going to have lovely time in marriage. But what happens with everything good on this earth is that Allah gives you tests. Okay, this whole life is about tests. You will never get a marriage without any problems. There will always be problems. Always, there are going to be marital problems. But it's what kind of problems do you have and how do you tolerate them and how do you deal with them? Now, once you have children, once you have children, I may Allah bless all of you with righteous children, say Amin. You have children, you know what happens is that you used to see each other before a lot. In your honeymoon period or in your early married life period, you used to really give each other a lot of time. Okay? Now, after that, what happens is when you get one child, one eye goes to one wife, the, your, your, your wife that you've got, her eye goes to you with one eye, and the other eye is for your beloved child. After a little while, what happens is you have two children. Mashallah, mashallah. With the two, two children, you have two eyes for your children. She has two eyes for the children. You don't see each other much. And then you have three children if you get blessed that far. But even if you have two, you're going from nappy to nappy. You're going from poo poo to poo poo. From pee pee to pee pee. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, you're going from cries to tears to laughter to vomiting to this to cleaning to mess and whatever. And you don't get to see each other. What I'm going to ask you to do is if you want to make your marriage a successful marriage, please make sure the times that you spent in the early part of your marriage, you're still doing that throughout your marriage. In the beginning, you couldn't get enough of each other. Do you guys understand? Yes or no? Some of you, I'm telling you, you're, you're really shy today. I'm telling you, none of you want to speak. Guys, you need to speak to me when I'm giving, when I'm talking to you. Do you understand me? Yes or no? Yes. Guys, before their marriage, he was up till 3 a.m. in the morning. 3 a.m. in the morning, he was texting and she was texting as well. You couldn't get enough of each other. After marriage, he was like, oh my God, this is the best life ever and everything. Well, what happened? Well, after you've discovered things about each other, what you should have done is you should have carried on oiling your marriage. Marriage needs oiling. What does that mean? I've been giving this in my marital counseling. I don't, I'm not asking anyone to come to me for marital counseling. I've done it for several people, yes, but I've done it for people who really, you know, really are close to me and so on. And what you realize is that the marriage becomes a little bit rough when people don't give time to each other, like they used to when it's the beginning of marriage. What you need to do right now, even if you're married, just get this done. Give each other 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day. That's it. This is 30 minutes of me time, you time. This is 30 minutes of our time. And in these 30 minutes, kids have to be put to bed or kids have to be in school, okay? Depending on what how you work and what your schedule is. In those 30 minutes, you look at each other and what do you talk about? You don't talk about life inside this house. Okay? What do you talk about? You talk about everything outside of this house and everything outside that you talk about hobbies, you talk about friends, you talk about uh, things that are in the mind, you talk about politics, you talk about the news, you talk about what's going on in the world. And you talk about ideas, you talk about things that happen, things that happen with other people that you know. You talk about your workplace, you talk about other stuff outside. And you connect with one another every day, 30 minutes. Right? Husbands come home, wives come home. And the biggest crisis that we've got right now is that we've got people on the phones. 
You spend more time with other people outside. You give them hours. You give them hours and hours. But you don't give even 30 minutes to your beloved. 30 minutes. What's 30 minutes? Honestly, 30 minutes. After that, you can go your ways and do what you have to do. Be on your phone. But give 30 minutes of time looking at each other face to face, phones away. Right? Give each other me time, you time, I time, our time. Right? This is us. And then over time, you will see your love will increase. And it will always stay gelled. Even if anyone's finding difficulty, please do this. This is a recipe. One more thing you need to add to these 30 minutes is this. When you start your 30 minutes, you get a book called Riyadh al-Salihin. It's a book by Imam Nawawi. And that book, you basically open it and you read out from it one hadith. Just one hadith. Okay, you can find translations of Riyadh al-Salihin. Darul Salam has done a very good translation out there. There are very uh, other good translations out there. But anyway, you can you find one good translation. Husband reads one hadith one day, wife reads a hadith one day. That's it. Close the book and then start talking to each other. This hadith will bring you together on a religious basis. Later on, your kids should join you in those five minutes or in those ten minutes. If you can put that, that Riyadh al-Salihin together as a family, it will bring wonders for your family. Even if there are non-practicing people in the family, they will become practicing over time by going through this hadith and there are certain ayats and verses in there. Anyway, this being said, you're now facing a marriage and in this marriage you've got certain things that you, you're going to have problems about and how do you deal with it? Because you know the one thing I said to you a little bit earlier is the role of a woman and the role of a man in the house. This is massive tension. Yes or no, guys? Yes or no? Yes. Now let's get down to it. Let's do it. All right. What's happened over time, my friends, is that we've had two different movements. We have a, we've had a movement from women to try and become equal as men and then superior to men. And now we've got a movement of men that want to become like what? We are this and that, these kind of men and so on. We're going to establish our authorities and so on. And what we found in this liberal, democratic, Western society is over the last, over the last hundred years, we've got women and men pitched against each other. This is not something Islam gave to us. Not something Islam gave to us. Now, I'm going to take you back to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because let's, let's, go to, let's go to the sunnah. And things I'm going to say to you, my brothers and my sisters, things I'm going to say to you, I want you to understand I'm only giving you my 30-something years of, of this life of studying the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi studying the Qur'an, and I'm telling you now what the Sunnah told us how to be. Okay, so we're going to go right back to the Prophet Sallallahu time. From there, then we're going to come back to this time, and then we're going to see what our modern world brought to us and what the differences are. Because honestly speaking, a lot of people, they want to quote the Sunnah, but they only quote what they like. They don't quote the other side. Let me give you an example. People want to quote the fasting of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they want to say, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fasted, right? Fasted on Mondays, fasted on Thursdays, he fasted three days in the month, he fasted... Uh, yes, yes, everyone wants to fast, fine! Good, but nobody wants to have the iftar of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm trying to say like, my man gets to his iftar, yeah? It's going to be like he hasn't eaten for five days. He just come out of prison. He hasn't eaten. He's going to be eating, eating like, whoa, 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 brother, whoa, brother. You want to you wanna fast like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fine, but try and take a little bit of the iftar of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a light iftar, something that is not so heavy. You, you smashing it inside like man versus food or something, right? This is not the time to do it. Now, people want to talk about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi business, okay, yeah, Rasulullah made money, he was a businessman, yes, Sahaba made money, they always quote this, yeah, but you know the sick thing I, I find about people is that they don't want to talk about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi ibadah, his level of worship, his level of commitment to the deen, his level of, you know, actually worshiping Allah, bowing down to Allah, reading his Quran, doing his dhikr, whatever, and the Sahaba, they don't want to quote that, they just want to quote about the money. Now you're taking one part of the sunnah, you're not taking the other part of the sunnah. Now let me get down to the marriage part. What do people quote? People are going to quote, wow, people come to the thing, thing about marriage and they say, look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They say, they quote the hadith and they'll say, look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and especially our sisters will quote this and there's a lot of Islamic speakers as well, they'll say it like this, but they're only taking one part of the sunnah and not the other part of the sunnah. What they're saying is correct. Don't get me wrong, what they're saying is correct. But they're only taking one part. What do they say? They quote the hadith, 
كَانَ فِي مِهْنَةِ أَهْلِهِ When the Prophet ﷺ came home, he used to do some of the chores of the house. He used to do some of the light tasks of the house. This is a hadith we've heard. And yes, Prophet ﷺ did it. But when did he do it? He did it when he wanted to. He did it voluntarily. He never came home and his wives were like, we left the dishes for you. No. Not a single hadith. He never came home and they said, that part of the household things that needs to be done, it's your duty to do it. No, never, never. He said, let's go to the sunnah. Come on, guys. I want you to be on the same page as me. Right? You got to take the sunnah, you got to take it properly. Don't take it half. Don't go quote the thing that just makes you happy. No. And Rasulullah, when he used to do the chores of the house, he used to do it voluntarily. It's his, it's his choice when he did it, however he did it. No one ever expected him to do it. Subhanallah. The next thing is this. What did Aisha radiallahu anha do? It's in a hadith of Bukhari. She was making the dough. Sometimes she used to even fall asleep doing that. You know, basically she used to go to sleep and she left the dough and so on. Fatima radiallahu anha, hadith, sahih hadith. She comes to the Prophet sallallahu and she says, I want a servant, Messenger of Allah. Please give me a servant. Why? Because my hands, are, my skin of my hands are peeling off because of the rough dough that I have to make. Their dough was different from the dough that we have. We have soft, we have soft, um, you know, um, powder, soft sort of, what are the wheat, wheat, wheat that we have, uh, the powder that they ground, uh, the, the ground it down to, but they had rough, they had rough, roughness to it. And he used to peel the skin of, sometimes he used to peel the skin uh, of, of their hands. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa never gave a, a, a servant. In fact, he went to the house of Ali and, and Fatima radiallahu anhuma and he told them to do the famous tasbih Fatimi. He said, do you want your chore, basically to get the chores of the house done easily? He said, say subhanallah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, and Allahu Akbar 34 times and so on, before you go to sleep. That was the way, and it's in a hadith of Bukhari and so on, right? So the thing is, Yes, there were chores, and who used to do them? Well, it was primarily, it was the women of the time that they used to do them. What did the men used to do? The men in the Prophet Sallallahu time, they had the responsibility of bringing the whole of the household needs from outside. They were the breadwinners. They were the people that made what was, you know, they bought, they bought all the money that is needed for this household to run. And not only that, the men provided for their women, they protected their women, and they made a life, such a life, that the woman has no worries for the future. That's, that's what it was about. Rasulullah sallallahu did the same thing, his sahaba did the same thing, that the women of that time knew that we are going to be looked after. We're just not going to be deserted. And we, we, we're going to look after whatever the household thing is, needs to be looked after. They looked after, when it came to children and so on, yes, tarbiya was done, and nurturing the children was done by both of them, yes. But there was a different balance at different times. So the woman, by nature, you will give more love and mercy and compassion to the child and looking after the child when they're from zero to seven. Then there'll be a time when you're giving like equal time, more or less from seven to 14. I'm not saying the men don't do anything at zero to seven, no. But I'm saying there'll be more from the women at zero to seven, but there'll be more from the men from 14 onwards. That's what the kind of balance was from one of the statements of Ali radiallahu anhu. My, my friends, what I'm trying to say to you is that it was a, it was a whole era of what? Allah said in the Holy Quran, النِّسَاءِ Allah said that you men, I have made you men that are responsible for women. Why? Because you have to provide from your wealth. Do you realize, my, my sisters, you by default, the money comes from your husband. He has to provide for your shelter. He provides for your clothing. He provides for your food. He provides for your necessities. He provides for you. He builds your future. He makes you what Allah has said in the Holy Quran. What is your status in Islam? Allah said, look at the fifth juz of the Quran. Allah said, Wal nisa. Those women that have entered fortresses. Women entered fortresses. What does that mean? Women who've accepted marriage, Allah said, you've entered a fortress. He gave, you the, he gave you the name Muhsanat. It means it comes from Hisn, which is a fortress. You've entered a fortress. What does that mean? You're protected. You're looked after. You're, you're, you have got a, a fortress around you where you have got, you know, where you feel that you're at ease, where, 
where, you're, where, where you've got a structure that is solid around you. And the man has to provide that protection and the solid future for you. That's where your, that's where your status comes from. As for the man, what did he, what did he, de, what, what did he do? And so what, what does he want? And what did Allah say about him? Allah gave him the responsibility to provide that. And look, this ayah, surah number four, ayah number 34 says, the women, they are going to take the monies from the men and the men are going to provide and look after, not just money, financial needs, you know, emotional needs and looking after you, making you feel secured. That's the one great thing every woman wants from a man, right? She wants to feel protected, secured, and she wants to know that her whole future is secured with you. Sisters, am I saying the right thing? Say a yes if it's a yes. Thank you. Right, thank you. I've spoken on behalf of you. <laughs> now I need to speak on behalf of my brothers. Okay? Now, brothers, what did you want in the marriage? Okay? You got into the marriage. Why? Allah said in the Holy Quran, in Surah number 30, ayah number 21, Allah Azza wa said, He has created for you. He created for you your spouses, your other halves. These are women. And they, he gives them to you. Why? Allah says, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you can find one thing that you need in your life. This one thing all men need. Right? Men are desperate for this one thing. What are they desperate for? Allah says, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you can find peace. You understand, guys? You can find peace. What does that mean? That means, if you look in the Quran, subhanAllah, the word sukun has come with three things. Three things in the Quran. Allah said, sukoon with your wife. Another one, Allah said, ja'ala lakumul layla sakana. Allah, uh, Allah said, he's made the night a means of peace for you. And the third one, Allah says, wallahu khalaqakum min buyutikum. Allah says, Allah's, cre uh, Allah's created for you houses. And then he says in that ayah, he said that he has made the houses a means of your peace. Min buyutikum sakana. Now, think about it. House, night, wife, three things you get peace with. What does my man want? My man wants a woman. And what kind of woman does he want? He wants a woman with femininity inside her. A woman wants a man with masculinity inside him. What's femininity? Let me explain this to you, sisters. This thing, a man will go crazy for you. And I'll, give, I'll come to you with what you go crazy with, with a man, okay? So what does a man want from you? Man wants you to be feminine. What does that mean? He wants that soft voice. He wants that softness from you. He wants that gentleness. He wants you to be caring. He wants you to be there for him, especially at night time. I hope you get what I'm trying to say, all right? Now, in return, what do the women want from you? She wants to feel protected. She wants you to be there for her. She wants you to be her man. Her knight in the shining armor, okay? She, she, she wants that, okay? Men, you know what they feel? They feel like they're a man. With their moment, they can do that to you. They're like, this is my woman. Like, oh, this is my woman. I'm going to look after my woman. I'm looking, I'm providing for her. She's been provided by me. They love this role. They feel like cherished and fulfilled. Like, it's like I'm fulfilling my role over here. The woman loves in your nature. You will love to be to be you know, looked after, protected, provided, and so on. So, if this is the case, and this is how it was for many, many, many years, and Allah Azza wa said in the Holy Quran, He gave this. So, for a woman, she wants all of this. For a man, he's got, like, a man has more, look, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to break it up a little bit more because some people might not get it. A woman wants from a man for her emotional needs to be fulfilled more than her physical needs. Right? That's what a woman wants. She's got a lot more emotional needs. Okay? She wants you to be nice to her. She wants you to be kind to her. Yes. And all those things go together. A man wants more of his physical needs to be provided more than his emotional needs. This is the, this is the basic nature of men and women. Now what happens sometimes is, if you're not giving your feminine side, and sometimes when you're not giving your masculine side, the whole balance goes wrong. And this is what we've entered. We've entered a world where we've been pitched against each other. It's not supposed to happen. And honestly, I'm saying there's a lot of marriages at stake because of this. 
I have told, and wallah, I'm going to say to you this, this, this thing to you because I actually believe in this, right? We've seen it with the generations before us. For centuries and centuries and centuries, it worked like this, right? The man becomes the sole breadwinner of, the of everything for the house from outside. The woman becomes the one that looks for everything inside the house. And they, this man and woman are a unit together, all right? It's the same thing I saw in my, my own mother and father. And I'm sure many of you, I don't know, if you're not as old as me, maybe you saw, saw it in your grandfather and your grandmother. They stuck by each other, doesn't matter how bad it got. But this is how they live their lives. And I've told my son, you know what I said to my son? My son's 19 years old. And I've set him straight. As a son, I w he's working right now. Okay? And I've said to him, son, I want you to find a woman who you're going to provide everything for her. You're going you're gonna to make a whole future and a whole, you know, whole life is going to be something that you can guarantee for her. But I want you to find a woman that looks after the inside of your house. She cooks, she cleans, she looks after your babies, okay? She does that and you look after her future and so on. It's a complete union and it's been working for centuries. You know what I've said to my 16-year-old daughter? And wallahi, I'm saying this to you separately. I said to my 16-year-old daughter, I said, daughter, she's studying at the moment, right? She's studying at the moment and inshallah she'll get a, she might get a part-time job and so on, fine. But you know what I said to her? I said, when you find a husband, I want you to find a husband that a husband says, I'll provide everything for you. You look after his house. You do everything that he needs. Look after his needs and the house's needs and the children's needs and let him look after your future and guarantee your protection and everything. I've said this eye to eye, looking eye to eye my daughter. If you're thinking that I'm just making this up, now, I'm not making this up. And why have I said this? Because when the balance breaks, it goes cuckoo shape, right? Balance breaks, it's all hell loose break. Now, sometimes, now let's get back to the modern world. The modern world is different, right? The modern world, we've got sometimes houses of mortgages you've got to pay. So sometimes the woman needs to go out to, to work. Okay, that's fine. Brother, sister, if you're married in a family where the woman needs to go out to work and she has to, then my first advice is try and make her go out for part-time work, not full-time work. And if you're going to make her go for more than part-time work, then that's up to you fine. Even part-time work, both of you, husband and wife, you share well, however you're going to run the house. That's up to you. I'm providing to you the sunnah way of how Rasulullah had it because Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Holy Quran, He said that He is the one that Allah called him, you know, He said, Ar Rijal. You know, these are men, meaning that in the Arabic language, you look at it, Rijal means that He's got the legs. What does that mean? He's got more stability. General population, talking about general population, comparison of women to men. Men have more stability than women, right? In the sense of a married life, in terms of like, because look, Allah gave the divorce in his, in his hands. Why? Because if there was divorce in the women's hands, okay, we know sometimes a lot of women can go through, you know, something where they probably just apply that divorce, right, straight away, like it might, it might happen. And that's why because of the, not, that stability not being there, Allah gave it to the men, so that they, they're more stable with that in their hands. Now man, once you've got the divorce thing in your hand, you're not supposed to threaten her with it. You're not supposed to make her feel down and say that I'm going to divorce you and I'll do this to you. And no, no, you're going to ruin your marriage. Your woman will go crazy for you if you're a strong man, more on the inside than the outside. What do I mean by that? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the strong man is not the man who can throw his adversary down in a wrestling match. The strong man is the one who can control himself when he's angry. When you're angry, bro, and you can, your woman is, is setting you like she's like, you know, trying to get you more angry and you just can control yourself. And two days pass by and then she says to you, you know what she's going to say to you? She's going to say to you, you know, I'm really sorry I didn't mean that and all that. I didn't want, I didn't want to say all that to you. But you know one thing she's going to say to you? She goes... She says to you, she goes, but you know, um, but you never said anything to me. You never, you, you didn't say anything bad to me, though I was bad to you. And you know what? She loves you more now. I'm telling you, Rana, she loves you more. Women, if you agree with me, just say yes. Thank you. Right. Guys, tell me this, yeah. The day when your woman, okay, she said something to you, she says something to you, she, you said okay, and she says to do it again, and she says to do it again, and she reminds you again, and it's coming again. It's like an alarm bell you can't switch off. It's coming to you again, it's coming to you again. It drives you guys crazy, yes or no? I'm talking on your behalf, guys. Yes or no? 
Right, it's the scare. I'm telling you, you guys, you, you women are quite strong here. You know what I'm saying? I'll give you some credit. Listen, the one thing a man doesn't want, okay, fine. You told him, you reminded him, you want him to change. I understand that, sister. Just find different ways of getting through to him, but you don't need to say it again and again and again and again and again. Now, if the man has heard you and he said it, he just, look, what does he want? He wants peace, okay? Now, if you can't get through to a man, right? There's plenty of ways of getting through to a man. Honestly speaking, if a man, sometimes, I'm a man myself, I'm telling you this, all right? All right? Men, sometimes, you can get through to them through their stomachs. Give them some good food. If your man, if your man is a foodie, if your man is a foodie and you're a good cook, you got it brilliant. I'm telling you. Just cook his best dish and so on, you can get through to him. All right? If your man is someone who has, who loves the cookies at night, if, I hope you know what I'm trying to say. He loves the cookies at night, then you give him the cookies at night. And he gets happy because a man, you know, he loves it. And if you're wor worried, women, that, you know, my man is going to start, because sometimes, you know what happens, I don't understand this, right? You know, if you have an argument between yourselves, why are you depriving each other of the thing Allah told you to do by default? Allah said to the man, or Allah said to the man, you have to provide for the woman. You know the man, some men, they get into an argument, then they say, okay, fine, I'm not going to give you this, right? I'm not gonna, that's, it, that's it, I'm not going to give you that, right? That's it, I'm not going to give you that much money. I'm not going to, no money. She looks at him, she says, yeah, no money. Tonight there's going to be no honey. And I'm saying, no cookies for you tonight, right? My God, what are you doing? My man, you can't bring your argument to the financial level. Financially, you have to look after it. You have to provide for it. You can't withhold that from your woman because this is your responsibility. Women, you cannot hold that away from him. You know what? Then they complain. The women complain. Oh, he's now interested outside of the marriage, right? Well, what? Well, you created the problem. I tell you one thing, my, my sister, if you don't want your man ever to go for another woman and so on, there's an easy way. Make sure you give him plenty of cookies. Just make sure that you rinse him every single night. I'm telling you one thing, he's not going to go for another person. Now, it's a serious thing I'm saying because a lot of the marital counseling we have to do, this is what we're hearing. We're hearing the women saying, he's not going to do this for me. He's like this. His attitude has changed. He, he's grumpy. He's, he's, you know, he's shouting at me. He's doing this and so on. And a lot of the men, what we hear from them, she's not giving me what I want, right? She's not being gentle towards me. She's not being, you know, the feminine side I said, you're not doing that. And the masculine side of you protecting her, being her honor, being a God, you're not doing that. The moment you stop that, you've got a serious problem that you brought to yourself right and I'm going to tell you straight up that you better you better change this because the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu is very very different I'm going to ask you that the Prophet sallallahu gave us a wonderful life all right I'm going to I'm going to come to to the end uh, of, of my speech I'm going to have Q&A very shortly okay the Prophet sallallahu showed us this right now we're living in a liberal western democratic world we've got ideas around us that pitch us against men pitch us against women We've got certain situations in our modern day life which wasn't there in the Prophet's life. Do not quote one sunnah by not quoting the other sunnah. I'm going to quickly tell you a story of the Prophet okay? And then we're going to go straight into Q&A. Uh, what is the story? Because a lot of people want to quote about the great character of the Prophet Yes, وسلم, his character was absolutely perfect. He was so merciful. He was rahmatul lil alamin. He had mercy for all of mankind. He, was, he used to come home. He used to walk inside. He used to straight away, smiley face, a cheerful face, okay? Salam first to his wife. His wives couldn't say salam to him before him. He comes in. He pecks his wife Aisha radiallahu anha on the cheek. Right? He says, how are you Aisha? How's your day? How you been feeling? Genuinely, okay? Then after he knows she's okay, he goes to his quarters. Subhanallah al-Azim. Such a wonderful, wonderful character and such a wonderful person Allah sent to this world. Now people want to quote that, but then they don't want to quote the other side. What's the other side? Did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa get ever, did he ever become angry? Yes, he did. Well, how come you haven't heard about it? Well, let me tell you about it very briefly, because nobody wants to talk about it. And what was his anger about? His anger was about his values. And this is one of the strongest men you will ever find. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was, in a hadith he says, he was stronger than 100 men of this world, right? Mentally, he was absolutely strong. Nobody could break him. Now this Habib, beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what happened is, 
When you got married, let's, let's, let me ask a question, right? If you women were in the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ was looking to get married again, which one of you women, if you were not married, which one of you women would want to become the next wife of the Prophet ﷺ? Put your hands up. Put your hands up, come on. That's good, that's good, right? If I was a woman, if I was a woman, and honestly, in the Prophet's time, honestly, I, I would have no hesitation in answering that question. Because you're getting married to the best, best creation Allah ever created. But guess what? Let me tell you one thing. Did you know, let me tell you the other side. Did you know that the biggest sunnah of the Prophet in a marriage with his wives, biggest thing was, there's no expectations. There's no money. There's nothing. There's no expectations. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, I saw from one full moon to another full moon to another full moon, two months in between, the, not even the stove of the Prophet in the house was lit with fire because nothing was there to cook. It was a time of poverty. They were living a time of poverty. And Rasulullah had, what, what did he have? She was asked, what did he eat? She said, dates and water. That's what we had for two months. So when women want to, you know, when they want that beloved husband and all that, you better think about the sunnah, which is no expectations. That what happens is this. Seven years into Medina life, the battle of Khaybar happens, okay? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he wins the battle. He has a lot of land that comes to his possession. With this land, what does he do? He first distributes it as spoils of war to the soldiers who fought in the battle. After that, he gives it to poor people. After that, he then calls his wives. And for the first time ever, he said to his wives, he had nine wives alive at the time, all of his wives, he said, all of you are going to get a piece of land for each and every one of you equal to another. Right? One piece of land equal to another. They were so happy. They were so elated. They went away. They had a discussion that day. And they said, you know what? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's got more, more land. Why don't we go and ask him tomorrow to give us more land before he distributes it? To the poor people and the masakeen and those who need it. So the next day when the Prophet ﷺ gathered his wives, they said, Messenger of Allah, we've got something to ask you. He said, what? One of them said, we want you to give us more land, please, because you've got more land. Just give us more now because you've got it with you. Just some additional land. We can all have it equal share again. Rasulullah's face changed. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said when he was angry, there was a vein in the middle of his forehead that was swelled. It was like pomegranates that you could, you could, you would have squeezed into his cheeks. That's how red his cheeks became with a white complexion of a face that he had. And Rasulullah says, you know what he did? He did not go to his wives that night, nor the next night, nor the next night, nor the next night, nor the next one, until what? 29 nights, he didn't go to a single wife. This is how angry the Prophet sallallahu was. And you know what happened? By the 30th day, the rumor spread. The rumor spread inside the masjid that the Prophet ﷺ has divorced all of his wives. It was a false rumor. Umar came in. He said, what? He said, the Prophet ﷺ has divorced all his wives. He, he said, where is he? And they said, he's in ha your daughter Hafsa's house. His daughter was married to the Prophet ﷺ. He, he went straight to his, to his daughter's house. There was a staircase there. Rasulullah ﷺ was at the top. He went there, he knocked, Prophet ﷺ gave him permission to come inside. When he came inside, he said, Messenger of Allah, he drew his sword. The Messenger of Allah, I heard you have divorced all your wives. Give me permission to behead my own daughter Hafsa's head. Prophet ﷺ calmed Umar down, he calmed him down. He told him he hasn't divorced his wives. Rasulullah ﷺ came down to the masjid. He spent time with the Sahaba. He quelled the whole situation down. From that night, he went back to his wives one night after another night in his rotation. His wives never asked him again for anything. The ayats came down. This is in the end of the 21st juz of the, of the Quran. It says, Ya ayyuhan nabi, ya, 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 ya. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, O Prophet, قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكْ Tell your wives, in kuntunna تُرِدْنَ الْحَيَاةَ dunya." If your wives want to have the world more, the world equals, because these were the wives of the Prophet then tell them, here, I'll give you more. But after that, I'm going to say goodbye to you with a divorce, with a nice divorce. I'll give you more. I'll tell you, go. And if your wives tell them if they want Allah and if they want their next life, then tell them this is how they should live. This is a hadith which most of us will not be talking about. Now you see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa how he did, how he had his anger. I want to tell you this to the men over here. It's a very big lesson, guys. Guys, when you're angry, you do not need to get physical. No way. 
No way. You don't need to raise your voice. You don't need to shout. You don't need to say anything. You just need to give. Like Rasulullah SAW, he gave so much love, so much love, so much love. Outside of this time, he used to peck his wife on the cheek. He used to smile at them. He used to say how wonderful, you know, wonderful things to them, okay? And then as soon as he got angry, he withdrew his love. That, that's all it was. That was enough for his wives to step back in line. That was it. And these were things on his values, okay? I'm going to tell you guys that you don't need to do any of those things which common men do. All you need to do is give a lot of love to your wives, but when it comes to them crossing the line, just go quiet. And when you go quiet, hopefully they should come back in line. When, when men become like men, when men become like men, women will become like women. When women become like women, men will become like men. That's what we're supposed to have lived like. Okay, this is true nature. God, my, my sisters, please, some of you might not be happy with what I'm saying. I'm telling you, Allah created you to melt the, the heart of a man. You can melt his heart just by you having your feminine, feminine qualities, qualities, feminine qualities. <laughs> Mashallah, I think uh, you guys put that, give me that. Yo, yo. Okay, let me get back to where I was. Feminine qualities coming out, and you guys show your masculine masculine qualities coming out. You will make wonders with your marriage. That's how you have a long, lovely, lasting marriage. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go straight to Q and A.